Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your personal astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's an honor to establish communication with you. My respect and admiration for your work. I saw your interviews on CNN and Colbert. We expressed interest in continuing the investigation. Because what I said was, here in America, we have a guy under oath saying he has aliens in a locked box. Well, why can't any, well, it's secret and nobody can see it. That's not useful to me as a scientist. I claim no special expertise in the analysis of biological tissue. That's the work of biologists and ideally biochemists. Your research needs to be written up, submitted for peer review, published in a research journal, and ultimately offer samples of your specimens for peer analysis, sharing your tissues via multiple labs. <coughs> when we went to the moon and brought back moon rocks, we shared them with the world. That's how you establish an objective truth using the methods and tools of science. Black holes. Cool. Properly named, the Nobel Prize in Physics from three years ago went to black holes, shared among three of my colleagues, 
Andrea Gaz, Reinhard Genzel, and Roger Penrose. Uh, Roger Penrose got half the money, and Andrea and Reinhardt split the other half. Uh, Penrose laid the theoretical foundation for the existence of black holes. Einstein, using his own equation, was in denial of black holes. It took people after him to do this. Penrose was among them. And by the way, I people comment on, on my blame, you know, but when I go to an astronomy conference, it's camouflage. <laughs> Now, notice the detail. <laughs> By the time the universe has expanded to today, that ultraviolet has redshifted into the infrared. So the James Webb Space Telescope is exquisitely tuned for the infrared to detect the redshifted light from galaxies born in the early universe. Yeah. <laughs> Dark matter, dark energy. 85% um, of the gravity we measure in the universe has no known origin, no known source. It's, it's literally dark gravity, but that's not what we call it. We call it dark matter, but we don't even know if it's matter. So we really shouldn't be calling it anything that would tip the scales in one thought regime or another. Dark energy is a mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space that's forcing the universe to accelerate in its expansion against the wishes of gravity. We don't know what's causing that either, but we measure it. We measure it. I we don't know if it's, and we shouldn't be calling it. Dark energy is nearly 70% of what's driving the universe. Dark matter is 27%. You put them together, 95% of what's driving this universe, we have no clue what it is. As an astrophysicist, you can only be humble because we are steeped. We, 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 no, we know so much about the universe, we can quantify our ignorance. <laughs> How about that? Can you that? Let me see. <laughs> All right, okay, okay, okay. This is actually the last, this is the last um, table of contents before the last op item, so we gotta do it. Okay, simulation universe. So let, let's go back to this guy, Nick Boster. He's a philosopher. Nick said, and by the way, we interview him on Star Talk, by the way, my podcast, if you want to take him up. Uh, yeah. So he thought to himself, as we, as our computing power gets faster and faster, we might have the urge to build a world inside the computer with people or creatures. And if the computing is powerful enough, you can make them think they have free will, even though you created them. All right, well suppose there they are with free will and then they invent computers. And they say, oh, we wanna make a world in our computers and so they make a world. Well, if this continues, there's only one real world and every other world is a simulation. So now clo close your eyes and throw a dart. Which of these worlds will you likely hit? Probably a simulated world. Which led to the suggestion that we do not have a good argument against we and this world and this universe being simulated in the computer of some alien kid in his parents' basement. <laughs> and 
so I don't know how much I can throw out the possibility that we are simulating. Can I give you my best argument that we're not? Yes. My best argument. Can we today simulate a perfect universe? No, of course not. Oh, that's interesting. So, when I say close your eyes and throw a dart, all those universes were equally available to the dart. But if we can't make another universe in our universe, we are none of those universes in between. We are either the first universe that's real, that hasn't gotten there yet, or we're the last universe that's still working on it. That makes us 50-50. I'm sticking with that. Death quantum, this was just so cool. It happened a few years ago. Uh, this, this spacecraft was the one you saw the video of that had deployed the Huygens probe down to, to Titan, one of Saturn's moons. Well, Cassini, once it was done, it's like, you don't want to just leave it in orbit around Saturn, it might accidentally crash into one of the moons. And if you're looking for life on that moon in the future, if somebody sneezed on this while it was in JPL, you don't want to discover the rhino virus on the, in space and find out that you put it there. <laughs> so, we plunge Cassini into Saturn, where it vaporizes. In fiery death, Saturn and you are one. VIP, vaporize in peace. Good <laughs> time, thank you. Thanksgiving dinner where the crazy relatives come over. Uh, I can't do it all. Just try to spread some science literacy in the world because the future of civilization is coming. Thank you all. Go ahead,